you are very, very welcome uh, to the third Sabi, Sabi uh, lecture. And uh, I am Reda Razavi. I'm the uh, university vice principal in research. Uh, and it's a pleasure to host you all here today. And I see so many faces. It's wonderful. So Peter Sabi Foundation have very generously, since 2015, supported uh, the coming together of two very key areas, uh, philosophy and medicine. And uh, I think bringing together th like the mind and the body, knowledge and judgment, um, life and death, are those things that, you know, I'm a physician, you think about as a medic, but also you do think about as a philosopher. And it's fantastic that we have such a great uh, wealth of knowledge and uh, academic powers at King's in this area. And so many, that, uh, I think what Peter Sarabi was very interested in, so many of our students are so interested in this, uh, particularly trying to get uh, philosophy into day-to-day -day practice of medical doctors. And of course, that starts with our medical students. So you're very, very welcome. It's great, great to have you here. We're going to have a couple of things before we come to the main course. So first, I'm going to introduce my colleague, our Provost for Arts and uh, Sciences, Fred Evenberg, who's going to tell you a little bit about the uh, endowments of the chair. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Evelyn Welsh. I am a professor of Renaissance studies and actually specialist in medical humanities. And it's a particular pleasure to add my welcome to that of Reza Razavi's to this third Saudi lecture. It's, it's a really special moment in this transition. When I arrived in 2013, one of the first and most exciting things which was going on was Professor M. M. McCabe, who's here in the audience, and Maria Rosa Antoniazza, then head of the philosophy department, were in deep discussion with the foundation about how to really bring to life Peter Sowerby's own deeply held view that doctors needed philosophy there. Whether philosophy needed doctors is a whole other question there, but certainly doctors needed philosophy there. And in endowing the Peter Sowerby chair in medicine and philosophy and medicine, if you get that the right way round there, um, there was a very strong sense that these two disciplines needed to speak to each other, not so much with a common language as with a common understanding. And to do that, you needed to learn each other's languages there. So we are at a really important moment in that last year, the real exercise of this foundational gift there took place with the introduction of a very important module um, in belief and decision making under uncertainty was introduced into stage one of the medical <coughs> curriculum there, ensuring that our first cohort of MBBS students actually were introduced to deep philosophical thinking and essay writing at the same time. And for this, we have to thank a very special person there. Professor Sherry Rausch joined us in 2015 as the inaugural Peter Sowerby Chair. She came from Berkeley in California, and sadly, she is now returning to the West Coast, where she'll be joining UCLA. She very much set up the foundational beginnings of the programme there, and I'm going to invite her and her successor, Alexander Bird, to come down and join me here. There. And apart from the monumental task of including the philosophy module in Stage 1 MBBS, Sherry has also um, created a colloquia, uh, created an essay contest, the outcome of which we're here today, this annual lecture, and has very much reinvigorated the integrated BSc in philosophy 
and a new MA program in philosophy of medicine and psychiatry there. So Sherry, we are going to miss you enormously, but we now look forward to London, California connections. Can we say thank you? And in true moment of transition, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Alexander Bird, our second Peter Sowerby Chair there. Um, he joins us from the University of Bristol in January 2018, and I wanted you all to see him so you can come up during the drinks afterwards and badger him about what he's going to do to build on this extraordinary legacy that Sherry and her team have created. His expertise is appropriately in epistemology and metaphysics of science and medicine. And he was saying only just a moment ago that he's just been marking essays on precisely the topic of mental health and philosophy and justice there. So, Gareth, I promise you, Alex will not be marking your lecture this <laughs> evening there, but we want very much to give you a warm welcome to King's College Lake, London. Thank you so much, Evelyn. That's great. And um, it's not often you see the outgoing and incoming professor on the stage together. So that's, that's great, too. So we're now going to get to announce the winner of the essay prize. So, Anne-Marie, down to you. Thank you. I am delighted uh, to be able now to announce uh, the winner of our essay contest. But before I do that, I would like to thank the six academics who spend their time evaluating these essays, and especially Dr. Perno, who has chaired the panel. So the Sowerby Essay Contest 2017 on decision-making capacity, who is to say the winner of the contest is the essay why we should assess uh, decision-making capacity, even though we cannot, by James uh, Fletcher. So I hope James is here. Yes, Charles. words about uh, James. Uh, James is a PhD candidate at the Institute of Gerontology in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London. His doctoral research explores informal dementia care from the perspective of people with dementia living in the East Midlands. He is also interested in health and social care mental health, aging, and age-related conditions. His work is heavily informed by symbolic interactionist and anti-psychiatrist ideas, as well as social theory more generally. His essay begins by considering whether we can assess decision-making capacity he then looks at the shortfalls of this approach, why this is not a perfect solution, but he does come to the conclusion in the end that we cannot really abandon decision making altogether on the one hand. On the other hand, people with cognitive impairments have had decisions made for them unnecessarily in the past. So this is uh, this uh, um, capacity assessment, James argues, is a rough guide. It is flawed in many ways, but preferable to not uh, assessing capacity. So thank you very much for your essay. Okay, 
So now for the main dish. Uh, Gareth Owen is one of our uh, academics, senior lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, and also a consultant uh, general psychiatrist at the Morsley Hospital. But uh, he also leads the uh, collaborative award from the Wellcome Trust, um, which is the sort of topic of the talk today on mental health and justice. Now, you'll hear a lot more about this in a second, but one of the things I was going to say that in the university we're very keen on bringing different disciplines together and cross interdisciplinary working is such an important part of what makes King's the great university it is. And there's no better example than the mental health and justice program from the Wellcome Trust because it involves so many different faculties from you know, IOPPN, psychiatry, to law, the, the uh, social sciences, and arts and humanities. So, so many different faculties involved in fantastic work. And Gareth, we were looking forward to your paper. Well, thank you, Reza. And thank you, Sherry, uh, for asking me to uh, give this talk and to, and to Rosa. So, it's a privilege to be asked. Okay, so the topic of the Sowerby lecture this year is mental health and justice, classical and romantic perspectives. So I'm going to begin by just giving an outline of the lecture, um, prepare you for what is to come. Uh, so I'm going to clarify what I mean by classical and romantic here. I'm going to look at psychiatry and law through these perspectives. And I'm going to introduce the mental capacity debates. And then I'm going to present some research. I want to show um, decision-making subjectivity, so the what it is like of decision-making, in patients with frontal lobe injury and uh, in mood disorder. Okay, I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that as we go through. And I'm going to argue that the assessment of decision-making capacity needs both the classical and the romantic perspectives. And I'm going to flag up this collaborative welcome uh, project on mental health and justice that's taking these themes forward. Historians of ideas and culture keep identifying two clusters of intellectual, emotional characteristics across civilizations. They've been variously termed. The philologists Winkelmann and Nietzsche drew attention to two opposing cultural tendency, tendencies within the ancient Greeks, the Apollonian and the Dionysian, mapping them onto the worship of two deities, Apollo, god of light, and Dionysus, god of wine. The philosopher Isaiah Berlin drew attention to two similar clusters within 18th century European cultural history, the Enlightenment and running with it and opposing it, the counter-Enlightenment. Goethe, summarizing the trends within the artistic and intellectual milieu of his day, spoke of the classical versus the romantic, occupying both positions himself in different ways across his rich career. These are not precise terms, rather they're family resemblances or broad patterns useful for our purposes. My preference will be for the terms classical and romantic. We can attribute to the classical perspective a list of qualities here in red. Objective, detached, cool, favoring explanation, rules, transparency, rational in orientation, individual, and interested in laws of nature. These emphasize a stance characterized by sobriety and rationality. Here, belief in truth and validity is projected. Similarly, we can attribute to the romantic perspective a list of qualities. Subjective, engaged, hot, favoring understanding, spontaneity, comfortable with obscurity, relativistic, social, and interested in contingencies of nature. 
Note many of these words are simple antonyms. But here we have a stance characterized by intense sympathetic engagement in experience, in which belief in spontaneity and context dependency is projected. Psychiatry has long attracted interpretations from both the classical and the romantic perspectives. Emil Kreplin, top left here, often regarded as the founder of modern psychiatry, held to the view that psychiatric disorders were basically disorders of the brain. He was, his was essentially a biological perspective. He was Alzheimer's research supervisor, as in Alzheimer's disease and thought that the major psychiatric disorders, such as schizophrenia or bipolar, would eventually yield to Alzheimer's approach and become recognized brain-based syndromes with characteristic abnormalities that could be just demonstrated by pathologists. Freud, top right, well known to all, took a cool classical perspective, ice cool. Though, of course, his reference was not to the brain so much as to basic psychological drives, the libido being his focus which set up rules, which set against rules and mores of upbringing and society, brought about conflicts within conscious mental life, the ego in his terminology, about which consciousness was not aware. Aaron Beck, the bottom here, the founder of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, is characteristically classical in approach. Unlike Freud, his emphasis is on conscious life, symptoms, and working collaboratively with patients to test the way symptoms derive from cognitive biases, assumed to have been acquired in early life. Beck teaches the patient to approach their own symptoms like a scientist approaches hypothesis testing. But running with these classical perspectives and interplaying and antagonizing them have always been romantic perspectives in, on psychiatry. Johann Ryle, top left here, a physician who coined the word psychiatry, thought in the tradition of Schelling's romantic natur philosophy. His 1803 book, Rhapsodies About Applying the Psychological Method of Treatment to Mental Breakdowns, reflects sympathies with the plights of people in asylums, advocates moral treatment, and considers madness to reflect wider social conditions. He believed advances in civilization created madness. French philosopher Michel Foucault, top right here, loved and hated amongst British philosophers, was a sort of romantic psychiatrist in early life. His construction of the history of madness is profoundly sympathetic with the experiences of mental illness and profoundly cynical about the categories used to order the material of madness, categorizing which he thought reflected social power relations. R.D. Lang, at the bottom here, was a Scottish psychiatrist who seduced whole swathes of university students and intellectuals in the 1970s with his wonderfully evocative accounts of schizophrenic experience and his dictum that insanity was, quotes, a perfectly rational adjustment to an insane world. One gets the picture. The romantic perspective is not the classical one. What about law? Well, in the field of mental health law, the main issue around which others tend to gravitate is consent, including the vexed issue of treatment without consent. A recent classical achievement in this area has been the English and Welsh Mental Capacity Act 2005. This codified a long tradition of Anglo-Saxon case law concerning when a decision about a matter of legal significance is valid. Consider a treatment decision about surgery. When is a consent or a refusal valid? The Mental Capacity Act holds that a decision maker needs to have relevant information. What's the surgery? What are its pros and cons? And they need to be making the decision voluntarily, free of extreme pressure or coercion. And essentially for the act, they need to be making the decision with mental capacity. According to this framework, the world gets divided up into having or not having mental capacity, though the law's default or presumption is that adults have mental capacity. If you have mental capacity, 
Then there are duties, let's say, of doctors to inform and to support a decision about, for example, surgery, but not to coerce the treatment decision. We're all used to surgeons taking consent. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. If you want it, then sign this form. But if you don't have mental capacity, then there are different duties. These are the duties of surrogate decision-making. The doctor or judge, if a case were to reach court, tries to decide your best interests, and the act lays out what steps need to be taken in establishing them. The concept of mental capacity is defined in the act, and the act makes it clear that it's always a question of capacity for what matter. So mental capacity in the modern usage is better termed decision-making capacity. You can lack it for one matter, but keep it for another matter. The Act also defines, in general terms, the relevant decision-making abilities. Understanding, retaining, using or weighing, and communicating. It recognises that these abilities can change over time, and it reminds us that a decision deemed unwise by others, for example, a controversial decision, is not a sufficient basis for a finding of incapacity. The Mental Capacity Act has been widely regarded as an exemplar piece of mental health law. It, prohib it prohibits the use of mental health status as sufficient grounds for surrogate or substitute decision-making. The test of decision-making capacity in the individual case and decision must be, must be applied. Other jurisdictions, so for example Singapore, have copied it almost word for word and it's been described as a, quote, masterpiece of legal clarity. But, we may ask, how are psychiatrists to interpret it? It can be hard and very newsworthy. This case from King's College Hospital concerned a woman who took an overdose resulting in renal failure. She wished to refuse kidney dialysis, which was predicted to cure her kidney failure, because she saw her life, age 50, losing its sparkle. The question was, what are her decision-making abilities? Suffice to say, it was contested. The High Court was tasked by the Mental Capacity Act with answering the question, and the stakes, life and death, were high. In this case, she was not found lacking the abilities to decide. The court considered the decision unwise, but respected it. She followed through and died. An even more recent legal achievement, but this time a romantic one, has been the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This is the international plane of human rights law, and the issue of consent is again central. Like the Mental Capacity Act, the CRPD, as it's called, regards the preconditions for valid consent to be relevant information and voluntariness, but it is silent on mental capacity. Instead, it highlights the concept of universal legal capacity. This is different to mental capacity. Universal legal capacity is not defined and is a sort of deep but obscure idea, standing for the inherent dignity of man fundamental human personhood, and the like. It seeks to recognize all people with disabilities, mental as well as physical, and recognize them fully as legal persons. This is Article 12 of the Convention regarding legal capacity. It emphasizes equality before the law for persons with mental illness. The emphasis on support implies that it's society's failings if the person with a mental illness is unable to exercise their legal capacity. It introduces a strong social model of disability. Ultimately, society disables, not any impairment of mind or brain. Most commentaries emerging from the United Nations at present are giving a highly radical interpretation of the Convention. Because mental health law makes consent conditional, for example, the Mental Capacity Act makes it conditional on decision-making capacity, the commentaries 
are considering all mental health law non-compliant with legal, universal legal capacity and are calling on state parties, of which the UK is one, to abolish their mental health laws. An attempt, an attempt at revolution or what's being called paradigm shift, is being attempted. The committee for the CRPD has been highly dismissive of the concept of mental capacity, writing, mental capacity is not, as is commonly presented, an objective, scientific and naturally occurring phenomenon. Mental capacity is contingent on social and political contexts, as are the disciplines, professions and practices which play a dominant role in assessing mental capacity. The bottom line claim is that decision-making capacities claim to objectivity are a sham. This arrival of radical interpretations of international human rights into sober domestic discussions has been quite an event and is ongoing. A useful representation is Anselm Feuerbach's painting, Plato's Symposium. On the right, we have a group of Athenian philosophers, Socrates, hand to chin, working on hard problems in a classical perspective. Uninvited guests arrive on the left, somewhat intoxicated, and led by the flamboyant and polarizing Alcibiades. The host, Agathon, greets them, hand outstretched and open. So in the UK, like in Feuerbach's symposium, we now have the U United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the Mental Capacity Act converging with all their interpretive differences on the discussion of mental illness. Let's stick with this core aspect of the romantic perspective, subjectivity. I'd like now to think about the subjectivity of consent in the context of the human frontal lobes often considered the seat of our deliberative potentials. And in the context of mood, the part of mental life that colors and motivates our choices. The frontal lobes are the component of the human brain which is expanded most during our passage through the various hominid stages of human evolution. We've transferred considerable energy to their functioning and probably dominated the natural world because of it. The romantic perspective on the frontal lobes returns a negative judgment. It's captured nicely in this cartoon lampooning human evolution. The dominant planning, executive and organizing functions of the frontal lobes is seen to be bringing about its, about its own kind of descent of man. The romantic perspective harks back to the primitive position of the human being living close to nature, integrated with it not detached from it by its frontal lobes. The most elaborated philosophical version of this can be seen in the pan-romanticism of the Stefan George circle of poets, philosophers in Germany in the 1920s. Ludwig Klages, circled here in red, is the exemplar and argued that the human being with its rational, detached, classical capabilities is a sort of sick animal Health was supposed to lie in a sort of Dionysian readjustment or in versions of humans found in primitive societies or in pre-civilized epochs. Here the romantic idea of civilization causing mental illness is apparent. So what is life like without the frontal lobes? The famous 1848 case of Phineas Gage is here instructive. Gage was a railway, a railway foreman working in the east coast of the USA. He was described as a prudent and deliberative character. One day, as part of his engineering work on the railways, he was packing some explosives using an iron rod. A mistake caused a spark which ignited the explosives and projected the iron rod through his head. The trajectory of the rod was through the frontal lobes, as this reconstruction shows. The notable fact was that immediately after the accident, Gage got up and, walking and talking, dusted himself down, bandaged his head, and went on his way. But his way had changed. He was no longer the prudent and deliberative Gage. He was imprudent and impulsive. He stopped working as an engineer and became a wandering traveler 
moving itinerantly across North and South America. Oliver Sacks, the neurologist and writer in his book, An Anthropologist on Mars, provides a romantic case study of one of his patients, Greg F., who had a frontal brain injury. He describes the in-the-moment, primitive, holy fool qualities of Greg F., and reports on the experiences of accompanying him to a rock concert. Sachs remarks in the romantic vein, we long for a holiday from our frontal lobes, a Dionysiac fiesta of sense and impulse. All of us need little holidays from our frontal lobes. What I want to do now is report on some research into the subjectivity of consent in these Phineas Gage cases. This research, which I conducted with Wayne Martin and Fabian Freyenhagen, shows what it's like to make decisions under conditions of frontal brain injury. These are interviews with carefully selected patients who all had the Phineas Gage-like psychological characteristics. Their personalities had all markedly changed post-brain injury. This excerpt gives a sense of, a sense of the in-the-moment-like quality, the Dionysiac fiesta of sense in impulse. We must remind ourselves of the all-too-human qualities. Right now, for example, I have to inhibit myself making a joke about Donald Trump's tweets. <laughs> also, self-awareness is often present in these cases and can enable us to sympathize. But let's look more closely at how self-awareness works within this experience. It was really weird, because in the hospital, everyone else was really bad. Like they couldn't walk or talk, totally mute. But I was fine. I was walking and talking, and I thought everything was fine. And when I went home, I was like gone. Every single day in the hospital, I was asking if I could go home. <laughs> I want to go home, I want to go home, I'm fine, look at me. You can see I'm fine. So eventually they gave in and they said, go on then, go home. And once I was home, it was just different, you know. Before I'd felt like I was better, I was fine. So when you were in hospital, you felt it was all okay, you were walking around, you could speak, think, express yourself. I was fine. But once I got out of hospital, I realized how bad I was. Outside of hospital, it didn't work out. No, that's when I realized how bad I was. Here we see one case, a ABI4, in reflective mode. He is reflecting that he lacked awareness of his deficits in relation to a decision to leave hospital in the past, and he's expressing this as acquired awareness. He speaks of his realization. One might therefore reasonably think that he will be able to use this awareness in deliberation going forward in real time when he is, so to speak, online. Now this is ABI4 a little later in the interview expressing frustration with being in hospital. <coughs> I want to get out, have a fresh start where no one knows me and I don't know anybody and start all over again, start totally fresh start a totally fresh life, a totally fresh life. And when you think like that, do you want to do it by yourself, alone, or do you want help from others? Do it myself. Do it yourself? Yeah, I mean, my uncle, when he got out of the nick nine or ten years, he's out now, he's living up north. When I get out of hospital, I go see him. So what you're saying is that what you prefer is to start again without any help from others. That's very, very different to hospital, isn't it, where there's an enormous amount of help that you're getting? I don't need this bollocks, referring to hospital care. I'm sick of it. We see that what came before, the retrospective awareness of deficit, is not being used. This phenomenon, where online or real-time awareness of deficit is not being shown as expected, repeated itself across interviews. It has many potential interpretations. Our best interpretation of this phenomenon drawing on data both inside and outside the interviews, is this. Online awareness of deficit is not shown because it's not available to the person. It is not a case of cannot use this awareness of deficit, but rather one of, 
it is, it, sorry, it is a case of cannot use this awareness of deficit rather than will not use it. In relation to some decisions of significance, this can be an inability to use relevant information, inability due to this lack of online awareness. This problem with online or real-time awareness is well shown within the interview itself in another case, ABI3. I mean, for example, in the restaurant, you had somebody kind of shout at you when you got irritated, and you kind of got into an argument which had got a bit out of hand. And it sort of started because whereas before, i.e. before the brain injury, you would have managed the situation, now you lose your temper? Yeah. Can you think of examples like that? Yeah, it does happen. It does happen. And then there's a noise from another patient in the background. I'll go out there and punch her on the fucking nose in a minute. She doesn't shut up. We see awareness of deficit. ABI3 says about his new impulsivity. Yeah, it does happen. But it melts away in real time. ABI3's awareness of deficit has no real-time effectiveness in the context in which decisions actually get made. It's not online awareness. This isn't the familiar impulsivity or insightlessness of everyday life. It's a qualitatively different sort and helps explain how people like Phineas Gage can drift radically downwards in social functioning after frontal brain injury. The implications of this is that when assessing decision-making capacity, we need to assess the relevant abilities. In severe brain injury cases, we need to be developing understanding of decision-making inabilities that are specific to the Phineas Gage syndrome. We need to see if people with brain injury are able to use information with retrospective awareness of deficit, but also, as ABI4 and ABI3 teach us, with online awareness of deficit. These forms of awareness can each be relevant to the process of deciding types of treatment or social care. Let's turn now to mood. Mood has long since attracted interest from the romantic perspective. Castiglione's La Melanconica from the Italian Renaissance is a fantastic representation of melancholia or depression. We see the characteristic physical posture of depression and the subject's awareness directed towards the skull, representing death. It is all too familiar, both to those who've experienced depression and to those who've interacted with it. Mania is also much in view from the romantic perspective. The psychiatrist and writer Kay Redfield Jameson has drawn attention to this with her study of past British writers and artists. A, a number, much greater than chance, had bipolar. A mood disorder with a pattern of fluctuating periods of mania and depression, often lasting several months. Jameson has given us the metaphor of touched with fire to help us understand how mania looks from the perspective of, say, romantic poetry. So in a similar vein to the brain injury research, let's now look at the subjectivity of consent in mood disorder. This draws on research with Wayne Martin and Tanya Gergel. We start by looking at the subjective experience of people with severe depression, many of whom were in and out of hospital. What's in your mind? Well, nothing. And in your feelings? No, I ain't got no feelings. Do you feel sad? No, I don't feel sad. I got no feelings at all, I don't think. I'm anxious again. You know everything's a distraction to take me away from what's going to happen. You know I go back to my room and lie there ready. That's why I lie in my room. Ready for what? Ready for death. Here we see affinities with the picture painted by Castiglione. The awareness of death, a future experience par excellence. How is the future experienced? Well, here are some illustrative accounts. What does it look like for you? What does tomorrow feel like? Oh, I don't know. I've got to get through tonight. Yeah? Just lying there. 
Does it feel like an eternity? Hmm. An eternity of what? Dark. And another case? What about tomorrow? I don't know. Same as today. Nothing. And another case. So you're in hospital at the moment, and there's the decision about whether to stay here or not stay here. There's this decision about whether to stay in hospital. Yeah. How do you see yourself in time to come, like in the next few weeks or months? What do you hope for? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know whether I've got a few weeks. There is an experience of future, but it's an experience of negation. Let's turn now to the other pole of, of mood, <coughs> mania. How is the future experienced under conditions of mania? Again, these are research interviews with people with severe illness, many in hospital. It's bright. It's very bright. It's as bright as the sun is. The light is part of me. I'm part of the circle of life. I'm part of the energy of life. And another case, Charlie in the chocolate factory. You know when the elevator smashes through the roof? Reach the peak and it's through the roof, through the ceiling. Not nasty. It's like being free. He looked down and he could see everything and everything was his. Another case, you think that everything's great and God's coming and stuff like that. Or you're part of God or you're making a change in the world so you don't care about yourself. Some further cases, all in acute phases of mania in bipolar. So when you think about the future now, how does the future seem to you? It's great, it's golden, it's wonderful. It's going to be full of all the things I could potentially have, create for myself. I know that my life will be full of abundance. Another case, so when you see, so what can you see if you look into the future? Palm trees, whitewashed buildings, hot sun, anywhere like that. And not just that, you know, places where I haven't been. Another, and what does it seem filled with, your future? It seems filled with a kind of ambition and drive, and I don't really know how to explain it, really, like hope and uh, positivity, creativity, innovation, I could just list off. Does the future seem good to you? It does seem good to me. It seems great to me. It seems great, and I can't wait for it. <coughs> like depression, there is a distinctive experience of the future, but rather than negation, it's its opposite. In mania, the future is experienced as possibility creation. It is unassailably positive. This isn't an experience of the future as including possibility creation, but as an experience of the future as possibility creation. In depression, the future is experienced as negation nothingness. Like mania, this is not an experience of the future as including negation, nothingness, but as negation, nothingness. Contrast this with the ordinary experience of the future. Ordinarily, we look to the future and we feel a mixture of possibility and negation. On this basis, we can achieve evaluative differentiation concerning the future, and we try to shape it accordingly. But in mania, experience of the future is fixed in the mode of possibility and creation, with the polar opposite in depression. This has implications for decision-making about one's mental health. Within severe depression, the negativity of one's future may rule out the possibility and consideration of recovery. If the future is unassailably negative, then previous experience of recovery becomes irrelevant. Conversely, with mania, if the future is destined to be positive, then that makes past experience of illness, even when recollected accurately, irrelevant to future health. We see evidence of this in the interview data. First, mania. I can't even imagine one. Referring to a future manic episode. I'm through it. I've not peaked and gone down. I'm in a different arena. This is a new game now. BP9 speaks in earnest when saying that an episode of illness cannot be imagined now, and BP9 could recount past episodes accurately. Similarly, with depression. Not possible to get better? 
how come you got better before then? I don't know, maybe it's the treatment I had. Could the treatment make you better again? It did then, it must have done. Could it do it again? No. Are you sure about that? Yes, yes. D5 is giving us their real experience when implying that getting better in the past from an episode of severe depression has no bearing on the future they now face. In severe mood disorder, we're seeing a potential for a temporal decision-making inability. We have interpreted this as an inability for evaluative differentiation concerning the future. Put oneself in the position of making a decision about treatment. Imagine using and weighing information about treatment options for mood disorder. There are a range of treatments. Some will help some won't, and the nature of mood is change. The process of deciding requires the ability for evaluative differentiation concerning the future. Severe depression and mania can threaten this ability, and assessment of decision-making capacity in mood disorder needs to assess the relevant ability. It needs to be tailored to the subjectivity of consent in both depression and mania. I've reviewed two forms of imbalance in the subjectivity of consent, showing relevant decision-making abilities and inabilities. Brain injury shows us an imbalance of self-awareness and a decision-making ability relating to online aware awareness. Severe mood disorder shows us a form of imbalance of temporality and decision-making ability relating to evaluative differentiation concerning the future. It is important to note that these forms of imbalance are distinctly human. We see this from the fact that artists, philosophers, have taken an interest in these states of mind. Why would they, unless their representations reflected who we are? And also because of the way that we need human interpretation to identify them. I want to expand a little on the justice theme now. I'll make use of an idea Tanya Gergel has put forward in the area of psychiatric stigma. This is the idea that attempts to reduce stigma face a paradox. If one tries to reduce it by objectifying severe mental illness, say along a disordered brain model, one makes people with mental illness seem too different from others. If one tries to reduce it by subjectifying severe mental illness, <coughs> say by normalizing it with ordinary human experience, one makes people with mental illness seem too similar to others. So imagine viewing from the purely classical perspective. As before, we see as the Mental Capacities Act sees, a mental capacity in capacity distinction. But with this perspective alone, the mental capacity incapacity distinction lacks interpretative context. It risks a cliff edge of incapacity over which people with severe mental illness may fall off into ununderstandability, a sort of black box of incapacity in which we stop knowing the person's experience. It can make the person with incapacity seem too different. At this point, we can hear Foucault's critical romantic voice about the classical language being a, quote, monologue of reason about unreason. We have lost the subjectivity of consent. Contrarywise, when we view from the purely romantic perspective, we see, as the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities sees, the inalienable universal rights of humanity. But with this perspective alone, we risk falsifying human experience and not giving people with mental incapacity enough credit, as it were. We make the person with severe mental illness seem too similar. At this point, we've lost the way in which the subjectivity of consent and capacity is not a free-for-all. It has non-arbitrary constraints. And at this point, we can hear Goethe's voice warning, quotes, classicism is health. Romanticism is disease. The argument of this talk has been that we need the classical and the romantic perspectives 
to adequately understand consent. Studies of the subjectivity in mental illness help us to show us human decision-making inabilities around self-awareness and temporality. More specifically, we need the classical and the romantic eye to identify the non-arbitrary subjectivity of incapacity. Now, Wayne Martin, Sherry Roosh and others in the Mental Health and Justice Project are currently working on the idea of non-arbitrariness being the right kind of objectivity for this area. This becomes particularly important in cases such as brain injury and affective disorder, where assessment of decision-making capacity can be hard using conventional medical tools and where the risk of getting it wrong can be high. But we also need both eyes when the assessment isn't hard and when incapacity to make a decision is clear. Here, the two eyes open approach prevents incapacity from collapsing into inhumanity. These judgments of decision-making capacity become matters of pressing practical concern in a variety of legal and clinical settings. Patients with brain injury often face major financial decisions in the wake of compensation payments post-injury. Patients with severe depression can be in situations where they are asked to consent to electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, or where they may, they may ask physicians to assist their dying. Patients with bipolar who have recovered from a manic episode may look to the future and want to bind themselves to earlier treatment when manic again, knowing that they will reject an offer of treatment at that time. Here, policy faces big and important challenges. Research on decision-making capacity, as well as supported decision-making, is being taken forward in a welcome-funded collaborative project, Mental Health and Justice, which I'm leading. The project comes at a time of considerable change. There is new interest in mental health and new energy to break down stale social assumptions relating to it. The, problem is the project is strongly interdisciplinary, going across three faculties at King's and involving several external partners. This is a research network of clinical experts, philosophers, neuroscientists, social scientists and service users. Complex health, social, ethical and legal problems benefit from an approach that takes in all these perspectives. And as I hope to have persuaded you in this talk, classical and romantic perspectives run through the area. There is an aphorism that the test of a civilization or a just society is the way that it responds to its mentally ill. I would suggest we need both the classical and the romantic perspectives to correctly interpret this aphorism. There's much work to do. That was a wonderful, wonderful paper. Thank you so much. We have time, um, and I hope we're going to have a rich discussion. You're open to asking some questions, yes, I hope. I'll try. So uh, why don't we do that? We'll kick off. Please just put your hand up and say your name, and then ask your question. I would first like to say that I felt that that was a very, very biased and misleading presentation. Um, the CRPD was mentioned, and it actually doesn't accept the paradigm of mental illness. Article 12 would see that by defining people and giving them a status of inferiority, that you're actually violating their human rights. And in many cases, that status of inferiority is the justification that psychiatry uses to abuse people's human rights. I think it's very important that rather than looking at it through classicism or romanticism, we look at it from a social justice perspective. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks for that, uh, you know, that, that uh, question, that critical, critical point you're making. Um, I mean, the CRPD, as you describe it, um, 
has been very influence, influ, influenced, certainly in its interpretations, from people who've had real experience of uh, being um, on the receiving end of compulsory psychiatric treatment. It, That's it's why it's talked to by the United Nations, not just treatment. We have to realise that maybe that's what the language this gentleman uses masquerades. These, these practices are torture and they abuse people's human rights. To describe them as care and treatment is deeply dishonest. Yeah, I think that you're right that cert certainly a lot of people who have been in the discussions around this convention would agree with this view that you have about, about torture. So I, I think that's, that's a reflection of, of other people's point of view. So I think it's a, a point you can make. But the, the point that you're making that the convention doesn't recognize mental illness, I think is wrong, actually. It recognizes disability, which is very, very broadly construed, and that includes mental disability. But the point about the convention and the social model uh, that the convention has been um, very influenced by is that it doesn't think that mental disability on, under any conditions can invalidate consent. And that's really uh, a big interpretive difference. It has been accepted as law, though. This country ratified the option protocol in 2009, which gives individuals who believe that their human rights are being abused a legal, legal discourse to actually go to the union. So thank you so much for that. Um, any more questions? Um, there's another quote that, we, that says we judge um, the state of civilization of a country by how we treat those in prison. Yeah. And we know that many people that end up in the prison system have suffered from a traumatic um, injury um, or um, a mental health condition. And I was wondering about your thoughts on how we see those who have committed offenses and their culpability uh, reflecting on um, what you're talking about in your presentation. To what extent can we hold people who've committed offenses that have um, mental health conditions or have suffered from um, injuries to the brain culpable? Yeah. No, I think what you, what you, what you say there is quite right. I mean, the, the, prevalence of, the prevalence of mental illness in prisons is astoundingly high and um, remains very high at, at the point of discharge from prison and the, and the service provision at that point is, is often shockingly, shockingly thin on the ground. And it, the prison system, or what you're describing here, is uh, actually a very big challenge for the, uh, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability that I mentioned. Because if you're somebody with a mental illness who gets involved with the criminal justice through an action that's criminal, uh, the CLPD would seem, at least the way it's currently being interpreted, would seem to take the view that you just have to be processed like every, any other criminal. Um, and how that will enable, if it were to really be influential in this country, how that would enable a society to deflect people away from prisons into treatment is very unclear at the moment and is a big, is a big, uh, big critical point in a way in the opposite direction. Okay, any more questions? Go ahead. Um, so the CRPD rejects the notion that substitute decision-making is ever acceptable and talks about supported decision-making instead of substitute decision-making. So I wonder what do you see as the role of supported decision-making and more yeah. resources and more effort put into supported decision-making in this debate? Yeah, I mean, I think one important just correction I'd like to make there is that the convention doesn't make that, doesn't make that rejection. It's the committee that makes that rejection. But... Um, Supported decision-making is a very important idea. I think this is one of the things that's actually, uh, that the, the CRPD is, is pushing, which is a very important uh, innovation uh, in mental health law. Um, and we're going to be working with that concept in mental health and justice. Uh, that's, that's central to our, to our uh, objective. Thanks. Um, so I guess I want to start off with a more philosophical question, um, which is that... I suppose um, I'm intrigued by the fact that you didn't delve too much into all of the political problematics in general surrounding the concept of consent, even as conceived as combining um, a degree of voluntariness and um, access to relevant information. Given that, having mentioned Foucault and Lang and all those guys, one of... <laughs> 
one of the points I wanted to make is that consent as a kind of singular action made by someone in the possession of something that we call a capacity, and however we choose to define that, then making that decision, that event occurs within a complex of power relations that, um, that aren't amenable for various reasons to free decision making. And I know that's, that sounds very, very obscure, <laughs> um, but the patient-psychiatrist relation is already from the off a higher one. And I mean, there's the question, I'm, I'm not sure, to, am I back? Um, so first of all, there's the question of like, who judges the capacity, if it's possible to judge? Um, what are the criteria for that? And almost, it seems to me that almost universally this seems to be in the hands of clinical professionals rather than any move towards the, the democratization of patient care. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, it's the point you're making there really about, about power relations and how that, how that affects um, these assessments. Um, I mean, one of the important things to know about the Mental Capacity Act is that uh, the motivation for it really wasn't coming from doctors, it was coming from carers. Uh, particularly people who are caring for, for um, you know, family loved ones with dementia or learning disabilities, who were very, very involved in the day-to-day -day care decisions. Um, and what those carers wanted was sort of greater legal certainty about what their decision-making position was. So really that's coming from much more of a kind of family context rather than um, from a context of, uh, that's medical. I mean, I focused on the medical uh, element, um, partly because it's, it's, the, um, it's the philosophy and medicine uh, um, lecture, but also because, I, because I'm a psychiatrist. And one of the things um, about psychiatry is that you're often, you're often asked to get involved in mental capacity assessments because you're considered to be uh, an expert or to have knowledge about the mental element. Um, and I think psychiatrists have different views about how, um, how good that is, uh, how willing they are to get involved. But it, on the ground is the case, as you say, that, um, that clinicians and particularly psychiatrists, clinical psychologists and others, get involved in these, in these, uh, in these assessments. Okay, there was a question further up. Yes, Thank you very much. I'm a, I'm a U.S. medical student um, at Kings. Um, thank you very much for your very insightful um, exposition on the romantic and classical views. But it seems that um, there needs to be a trade-off. And I was wondering if you could comment on that trade-off from your personal stance. Where do we, what does it look like on a policy level? I can tell you what it doesn't look like on a policy level, which is that is that you go into your clinical career as a doctor having been exposed to online electronic learning about capacity assessments where you get taught to consider it like an algorithm. That's not what it looks like. <laughs> and I'm afraid there's all too... I'm afraid there's all... <laughs> I'm afraid there's too much of that. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a psychiatrist. And I'm, what I was saying is I don't see how the notions of classical and romantic are at all helpful in making and helping us with an individual decision, such as the woman who wants to uh, check out at the age of 50 or the, or the manic or the depressive person, etc., who has to make a decision. They don't want ECT. They don't want medication. They do. They want to leave hospital, whatever. I mean, the case of uh, the Sparkly case, as it's um, became, become known, is um, I mean, the, uh, she was a woman who uh, was wanting to live a life um, which is, uh, on one reading, straight out of a romantic novel. Now, the question really is, um, what are you going to do with that when you go to see her? as a psychiatrist. Now in the High Court, because this, this case went to the High Court, the two psychiatrists who, who considered to her to lack capacity were 
gently criticised for not entering into uh, an understanding of that kind of personality structure, which had endured and had persisted across time. So I suppose the question is, what are you going to do in a situation where um, you're defending a judgment in a court where uh, the judge is really expecting you to... Um, suspend your own value judgments as a professional and as a scientist, as a clinician, um, e even as a man, uh, and try to enter into the um, value structure of another person. So these are very real issues. Keeps judges and psychiatrists up at night, as you know. I understood all that, but where, where is the romantic um, classical perspectives assist? Well, on the Sparkly case, um, the, the court essentially criticised the, criticizes the, the uh, assessing psychiatrists for not being able to understand sufficiently uh, how that uh, woman wanted to lead her life, was what were her guiding lights. Latin. So that's, that's very much a call to understand her, her lived experience or her subjectivity. Lack which, romantic. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's, it's called to that perspective. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Molly. Um, so I just wanted to say about... Um, so the idea of the evaluative differentiation that you talk about people having a kind of sort of disordered evaluative differentiation when they, don't lack, when they lack capacity, and also impulse control, and, and they seem to be your two central tenets of when it is okay to question capacity from what I've understood. And I'd say that both of those things are completely meaningless unless you have the context. So evaluative differentiation, how you make decisions about your future, is completely dependent on how much power you have over your future. <laughs> so, for example, would you describe a woman who knows that every time she calls the police in a domestic violence setting, she's told that she's imagined the whole thing, that she's obviously made it happen, she's tried to get refuge, she can't access refuge, her life seems really, really hopeless. Would you say that she, her ability to evaluate evaluative differentiation is pathological, or would you say that it's actually very reasonable? Um, and then impulse control. So you talked about the quote with the Anna Kornikova comments, which are really sexist. And I suppose it's about the idea of impulse control being really contextual again. So down the pub, potentially within a culture of toxic masculinity, that would be an incredibly acceptable thing to say. So nothing to do with impulse control. It might actually be about... Um, a sense of identity and um, masculinity within the kind of accepted and raised up ideas. So I just think these things without context is completely meaningless. And I think that this concept, I think for me it's really about power and power relations, which kind of commented on what you were talking about and the CRPD comments from lots of people here. And I think that the amount of people that have um, killed themselves after the um, brown letters that have come through the door with work capability assessments and the grave and systemic violations of human rights by the DWP, by our Tory government. Um, to me, that's where the CRPD really wins because it doesn't describe it as mental illness, it describes it as psychosocial disability and that is the responsibility of everybody, not your problem as an individual. And I thought you really highlighted from my perspective what I imagine your viewpoint is when you talked about people with lived experiences, A1, A2, A3, and then you said, we have the ability to make differentiated evaluative decisions, including everybody here as a we, and those people over there as A1, A2. And so for me, that really, really smacked of a pretty classical, old school bias perspective. Thank you. Okay. There speaks a romantic. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you were making a lot of points there. Uh, uh, I mean, can I just pick up on one of them, which I think is interesting, about um, the domestic violence situation that you described there, um, and uh, how the future looks when your options are kind of um, uh, tending to zero. Uh, and, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I think I've met quite a few people who are in that situation, um, and they are, oh, in many respects, very disabled, actually, in terms of their decision-making. Um, and what the CRPD, I think, is saying, which is helpful, 
is that you have to first ask the question of how to support somebody or somebody's decision making in that setting. And so certain things that may be done, such as bringing in somebody else who's trusted, uh, having a kind of conversation with, with somebody like that, which is very unfamiliar to them, which actually instills some hope, can actually change their whole experience of future. And you can see that happening within an interview, uh, within the course of hours or days, as, as uh, mental health social services mobilize around that individual. And you can see the future literally opening up uh, as those interventions are made. But those are different cases to the ones that I'm describing here. The, 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 the ones I'm describing here are, are cases of um, severe depression of people who've been in a state of mind uh, similar to the one that I'm, I'm kind of giving you a feel of in these, tr in these excerpts uh, for potentially months uh, in which all of those sorts of interventions have been made uh, and uh, the future has not opened up and that the experience and the whole pattern of illness is fitting into a kind of syndrome which, as psychiatrists, we identify and have identified for you know, many, many decades as depression or as clinical depression. So I think the point you're making is very, very interesting, but there's, there's, a, there's a risk of speaking at cross purposes. Hello. I'm a, can you hear me? Yes. I'm a, a frontline brain injury practitioner. Yes. Brain injury isn't often interpreted as within the mental health spectrum because it fits into physical disability, learning disability, and often doesn't go into the mental health services. And being a frontline practitioner, what we find is that people take the, the assessors are taking everything at face value rather than investigating. So most things don't go into court. We're dealing with things on a day-to-day -day basis, and most assessors are you doing, looking at everything in face value of what the client says rather than what they actually do. And, and we have lots of issues of fluctuating capacity where one day they'll say the right thing and they won't do the right thing or whatever their right thing is. They'll do it, say what they're going to do and then don't do it from one day to the next. So they're fluctuating from one day to the next, but mental capacity is to see a decision and being put in over time. If most practitioners only see them once, most of our clients are being deemed to have capacity when they are becoming more vulnerable and more at risk of death as a consequence of the assessments they're receiving. Is there any way around some of this? Yeah, well, I'm glad you've spoken because I, mean, I think it gives the context of the brain injury cases that these are uh, a potentially very forgotten uh, group of people and the social response to them is oftentimes very inadequate. Uh, and very disproportionate to the to the actual dis to, you know the difficulties they're facing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is why I was keen to draw attention to this. Is why it was a research project. Is that the assessment of decision-making capacity in this group has been very difficult. Um, you know, people get it wrong. Uh, they don't really have a framework for doing it. Uh, when you look when you look at the court judgments, I'm involved now in some research looking at a lot of the court of protection judgments. You know, do judges have some sort of fantastic way of doing it which clinicians don't? The answer is no, they don't really. They muddle through like, like we're doing currently. Um, so you, therefore, um, you know, it's, this is what we should be doing, research. <laughs> so one final question. Gentlemen, and Green Hill. There's a microphone coming your way. Hi, um, sorry. Um, so I just wanted to ask, I mean, from my perspective of the Mental Capacity Act, the cards seem to be stacked quite against the romantic perspective. It takes, a, for my opinion, quite a classical approach. And so I wondered, from your perspective, how would you go about helping those doctors in the front line or medical students even who are going through their training take into account the romantic perspective? And also, just funnily enough, from a medical legal point of view, documenting how one has taken a romantic perspective into account to kind of give your capacity assessment more of a, shall we say, a philosophical approach, just given the constraints some was facing yes. on, on calls that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I just wondered from your yeah, idea... Yeah, no, it's, it's a nice question, yeah. I mean, uh, well, at the Maudsley, we're, at the Maudsley Hospital, we're very keen to try to, treat, to train our, our, uh, our young psychiatrists in the tradition of psychiatric phenomenology, which is basically a training in... In, in getting very clear understandings of what it's like 
in different uh, sorts of um, uh, mental illnesses. You know, the, the experience of depression is very, very different to the experience of brain injury, which is very, very different to the experience of, um, of mania. So to have a, a sense of that sheer diversity and to have kind of frameworks or understandings um, to break that down uh, when you're interviewing people, uh, we value a lot at the Maudsley and the training there. Um, so that would be one, one approach. But I think just the practical aspect of how you put across or demonstrate this, um, this more romantic perspective when you're doing capacity evaluations um, is, to, uh, um, is to document and to document um, uh, what aspects of the interview um, and to try to bring alive in your documentation how people are actually experiencing things or to bring alive in your descriptions of behavior and so forth how the world really is to them. Because as we know from the brain injury cases, you know, how somebody can be in a supermarket can be completely different to how they, to how they are in, a consult in the structured environment of a consultation room. Um, so to be able to develop those sorts of uh, descriptive capabilities, I think, are very interesting. I mean, Oliver Sacks was very good at it. He's one model. But actually, when you go to court and you're presenting uh, reports, judges are also very interested in reading those descriptions because you're really giving them data, data that they're interested in. Well, that has been a fantastic uh, paper and a great discussion. We will have opportunity afterwards to carry on. So can we all thank again, Gareth? <laughs>